Hi everyone and welcome to part two. This is the second lesson for from chapter six, Metabolism and Energy. So we've covered these first four objectives in our first lesson. So what we have left to do here is define enzyme, describe the usefulness of enzymes in biochemical reactions, and define metabolism and describe its purpose or purpose says with regard to cell function. So here we go. So enzymes are, so you remember last time we talked about catalysts and catalysts lower the activation energy so that a reaction doesn't take a million years to happen. In biochemical systems, we call those catalysts enzymes. Enzymes then are catalysts that act to lower the activation energy of biochemical reactions. Enzymes are proteins. And by the way, just um, as a afterthought, really, RNA can act as an enzyme sometimes. And if you've ever heard of an RNA, the RNA world, back in the beginning of time, after the Big Bang in the primordial soup, the theory is, uh, the hypothesis is, that RNA existed first and it acted as its own enzyme to make more of itself, etc. And then DNA grew from there and so on and so on. Okay, so enzymes are three-dimensional and which means that their structure is tertiary. So enzymes are these globular type of protein. So you take the, after the message is translated, you have this long string of amino acids, that's primary structure. You fold it on itself to uh, form alpha, hel uh, alpha helices or beta pleated sheets, that secondary structure, and then you fold it on itself again and make this glob and that's tertiary structure. So enzymes are tertiary structure. Enzymes are extremely specific. Now, this is important to remember, and this is one of the one of the big umbrella concepts you want to get out of this lesson. Enzymes are extremely specific. In other words, each enzyme does only one job and it does and it works on only one molecule. We call that molecule the substrate. So in other words, if you have an enzyme that um, <clears throat> breaks down protein, for instance, that enzyme only breaks down protein. It cannot break down or digest starches. It cannot digest or break down carbohydrates, only proteins. And protein is the substrate. In fact, we call those kinds of enzymes just in general proteases, protein aces. I'll explain the ace in a minute. The, the substrate then, protein in the case of a protease, binds to the active site. So as we'll see, enzymes uh, have a chemical site. We call it the active site. And its chemical configuration will, will accept only the chemical configuration of the substrate. We call that the lock and key model. I'll show you a picture in a minute. So when the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme, we call that the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, when the, uh, when the enzyme binds to its substrate or when the substrate binds to its enzyme, called the enzyme substrate, substrate complex. Enzymes are, are usually, enzyme names, usually end in ASE. So if you see a word as you're reading along in your textbook or further on down the road, if you see, uh, if you're reading a science, uh, scientific uh, source or resource and you see a word ending in ASE, generally you're going to be talking about an enzyme. And so I used uh, the term protease, right? Protease is kind of a, a short way to say proteinase. Proteinase uh, sounds a little confusing maybe. So the powers of B just shorten it to protease. 
And the fact that the ace, uh, the, the word ends in ASE, that denotes an enzyme. So a protein ACE is an enzyme ASE that breaks down protein, protein ACE or protease. Okay. All right. We'll see more examples of enzymes in a little bit. All right, so here is that enzyme substrate complex. This is the big globular enzyme, tertiary uh, protein and tertiary structure. And here's the substrate, right? If this is protease, then that's a piece of protein. And its chemical configuration perfectly matches the chemical configuration of this part of the enzyme which we call the active site and when the substrate jumps in here and binds to the enzyme we call this the enzyme substrate complex okay we refer to it as a lock in key <clears throat> A lock and key or we call this the lock and key model and that is remember that I said enzymes are extremely specific right one enzyme works on only one type of substrate and so if we think about the situation here is uh, uh, the enzyme and if we think about this as a lock we use that as an illustration then the substrate is the this one specific substrate is the only thing that is going to cause this enzyme to work it's the only thing that's going to open up this enzyme to do its job and so if we think of this the enzyme as the lock then the substrate is the key and since enzymes are very specific like locks are very specific only one type of key will fit into that lock to open the lock okay so you know um, your key the key to your car will not fit into the ignition of my car so that you can start it up and drive it away okay your key is very specific to your ignition my key is very specific to my ignition okay Call that the lock and key model. So the chemical conformation or the shape, the chemical shape of the substrate and the active site allow them to bind together like the lock and the key. Only, only one type of key fits into one particular type of lock. And so the substrate fits into the active side of the enzyme like a key fits into a lock and we call that the lock and key model. If you ever see that or read, read that in your, if you've read that in a textbook, now you know what that means. So after doing its job, this is interesting, after doing its job, the substrate is released from the active site. So in the case of protease, right, the protein binds to the active site of protease. Protease does the job of breaking down the protein, uh, breaking chemical bonds, hydrolyzing chemical bonds, releasing amino acids. Okay, that's the job of protease, to break down protein into its component amino acids. It releases amino acids. Now, once that substrate, or really the products of, of the action of the enzyme at this point now, once they get released, then the enzyme is open, right? It's an open lock again. Um, not an open lock, but, but the, the hole where you put the key um, no longer has a key in there. So now that lock, another key can come in, another identical key can come in and open that lock or turn that enzyme on. So the substrate is released from the active site after the enzyme does its job and the enzyme is free to act on another molecule. So that protease, once it releases its amino acids, it can take on another piece of protein 
It can break that down, release amino acids, take on another piece of protein, break it into amino acids, release those amino acids, and so on and so on and so on. That unless something um, dramatic happens to that enzyme, and we'll talk about those situations in a second, unless something dramatic happens to the enzyme, it is free to flow throughout the system looking for more of its particular substrate. Okay, enzymes work best at homeostatic norms, right? So bio, biochemical homeostasis or homeostatic balance, you've heard me use those terms before, um, are conditions in which the organism, your body for instance, is always striving to meet a blood pH of 7, which is neutral. It never gets there, right? As I've said, well, it may get there, but only momentarily, and then it may jump down to 6.9 or jump up to 7.2, back to 7, like that, back and forth. But it's, it's in a very narrow range is that homeostatic norm where everything can still function normally where you're otherwise healthy. You're doing what you need to do. We call those homeostatic norms like a blood pH of 7 or a body temperature of 37 degrees C. 37 degrees C is 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's normal human body temperature. Right outside of normal human body temperature, right? When you get a fever, and your temperature jumps up to 101 or 102, then your enzymes start shutting down, and that's when you feel like crud. The muscles stop working, digestion stops working, your vision gets blurry, all those things that you experience when you're sick, when you have the flu, that's because the enzymes are no longer working. Your, your body temperature is outside of the homeostatic range. So extreme conditions adversely affect the action of enzymes. And there you go. That's what I just said. When you're sick with fever, for example, you have the flu, enzymes stop working. And that's the reason you feel so bad when you have the flu, right? Okay, here is a nice uh, image nice illustration of an enzyme in action showing you the globular enzyme tertiary protein structure with its open active site so it is flowing through the system looking for a substrate a very specific substrate right so here we see a molecule this is sucrose this is glucose bound to fructose, this is sucrose, you just ate a candy bar, and so this enzyme we would call sucralase. It doesn't work on other kinds of sugars, it only works on sucrose, so we call it sucralase. So it travels through the system looking for a molecule of sucrose, and there it finds one, there's your sucrose molecule, Here's your enzyme, the sucrose molecule, is chemically attracted, binds to the active site of the enzyme. Now we have the enzyme substrate complex. This shows you a little molecule of water because this enzyme is using the process of hydrolysis to break the chemical bond between the two monomers of sugar. Here we see the chemical bond is broken. It's been hydrolyzed. And now the enzyme sucralase releases its one molecule of glucose, its one molecule of fructose. It is now empty and now it can travel around and look for another molecule of sucrose, right? This doesn't change. The fact that it has done work and released its products uh, doesn't change the action of the enzyme doesn't change its uh, chemical conformation or, or, or its chemical shape and it, can, and it is free to search for another molecule of sucrose to do the same thing over again. All right. Again, unless something drastic happens and this enzyme becomes, what's the term? 
where, an, where a protein is no longer functional, denatured. Factors affecting enzyme function. In other words, factors that will denature an enzyme. When an enzyme loses function, we say that that enzyme, remember enzymes are proteins, we say that those proteins have been denatured. So any number of environmental factors can adversely affect or denature enzymes, like temperature. Low temperatures slow or stop the enzyme from working. One of the little um, experiments, exercises that you'll do in lab um, will very clearly illustrate this fact. Low temperatures, they do not denature enzymes, they do not destroy enzymes, but they do slow down or if it's really, really cold, stop the enzymes from working. So that's why when you go outside in the winter time, you know, and it's five degrees outside and there's two feet of snow on the ground, okay, you get cold, yes, but you get stiff. You're still alive, you can still breathe, you can still move around, but you're really, you get really stiff because those enzymes, while working, they have been, uh, their action has been slowed down or hindered, inhibited, I guess. But you're, you're still alive, things are cool. Um, your, you know, your enzymes are, have not been denatured. High temperatures, on the other hand, denature enzymes. And so we can see down here in this little graph, the optimum temperature for human enzymes here is just a little bit beyond, this is uh, temperature in degrees Celsius. Uh, it's in a very narrow range, right? Between, I don't know, 36 and 42 maybe, right there, that's optimum temperature. And it, as you can see, in cooler temperatures, the enzymes, they can work, but only very minimally, very slowly. And look, as temperatures rise, then the action of the enzyme, the rate of reaction, the enzyme starts working better. And when you get to that optimum temperature, you know, the, and the enzyme is working, it's churning out, it's churning out product, it's doing its job. Now, um, over here we see very warm temperatures. Now this is uh, enzymes from hot springs, okay? So um, I, we've talked about um, extremophiles, archaea, that live in extreme environments, extreme cold, um, extreme hot, like in hot springs or like in thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Um, their optimal or optimum, optimal uh, functional temperature is much higher than normal human enzymes. And as you can see here, the higher the temperature, look, it's well above 70 degrees C, the higher the temperature, the better these things work. Of course, up to a, up to a certain point. There's an optimum te temperature we're talking about. So normal human enzymes, we're talking about like 36 to 42 degrees C, but there are other enzymes that can handle very extreme temperatures. Most enzymes, we're talking about enzymes within the human body, most enzymes work best at about 35 to 40 degrees C, right around normal body temperature. Okay, pH is another pH, um, that's the degree of acidity or alkalinity of a solution, you learned about that in chapter one. Um, pH can also affect the action of enzymes. pH remembers hydrogen ion concentration, Acidic solutions, remember on the pH scale, seven is neutral. Anything below seven is acidic. For instance, like a can of soda is like pH three. Um, and anything above seven is alkaline or another term we use there is basic. So 
household bleach is like pH 14 it's way way up there most human enzymes work best at pH between about 6 and 8 optimally pH 7 that's neutral now here you have two different um, enzymes that um, that that are these are digestive enzymes and you can see here this this is pepsin and this is an enzyme in stomach acid okay and you can see here on the pH scale this goes up one to nine seven is neutral you can see on the pH scale that pepsin here you don't have to remember pepsin and trypsin but but there are enzymes like with temperature there are enzymes that work outside of the norm okay and so in this case pepsin is a digestive enzyme in the stomach stomach which is a very acidic environment you know this so in order in order for this enzyme pepsin to work properly it must be able to work function exist in a much lower pH than normal or neutral and as you can see here pepsin is about 2.5 here so it's very uh, it works perfectly in a very acidic environment versus trypsin which is uh, works very well in an environment this is pH of about 6.5 right and so most human enzymes work best in that very narrow range between about six and eight. So we're looking at 6.5, there's seven neutral, here's eight. So right in that range. Let's go to the video. Okay, the video that I would like for you to watch, um, you'll have to do this on your own computer I understand you can't get to these videos on your school computers but it's a YouTube video it's called enzymes nature's factory workers here's the link and I put the link in your module 3 uh, menu so you can check it out there all right another quick check so enzymes represent which level of protein structure of course you know this your choices are primary secondary tertiary and quaternary I'll give you a second enzymes represent which level of protein structure well I said you'll recall that enzymes are are globular right remember that primary structure is that long line long chain of amino acids secondary structure is when you take that chain and you fold it on itself to make an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet tertiary structure is when you take secondary structure and you fold it again on itself to make a globular kind of um, protein or structure quaternary structure is when you take multiple globular tertiary proteins and link them together like hemoglobin or insulin okay and so from those brief descriptions you should know that enzymes represent tertiary protein structure they're the globular ones another quick check most enzymes important to humans function best at so here we're talking about optimal homeostatic norms your choices are 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit at a pH 5 37 degrees Celsius at a pH 7 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit at a pH of 14 and 37 degrees Celsius at a pH of 3 so most enzymes not including things like pepsin that work in the human gut or, di or stomach digestive system most human enzymes function best at okay body temperature is your first criterion 
that we've talked about here and neutral pH. So those are the two things that you're considering here. 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is certainly normal body temperature, but a pH of 5 is outside of that normal range, right, which is about 6 to 8. And that's really kind of, that's a wider range than most um, than most people would agree with, uh, myself included. Um, I think it's the, the range for most human enzymes is much more narrow. 37 degrees C. Now, if you didn't pick up on it earlier, and since this is science, we're talking about the metric system, which is Celsius. So 37 degrees Celsius is normal body temperature. 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, normal body temperature pH 7 and on the scale you know that pH 7 is neutral. 98.6 Fahrenheit normal body temperature pH 14 that's way basic or way alkaline. 37 degrees Celsius normal body temperature pH 3 that's like pepsin right that's like um, your soda you know Pepsi coke whatever you like it's down there pH 3 that's not normal for most enzymes all right so if you answered 37 degrees C which is normal body temperature and pH of 7 which is neutral then that is absolutely correct factors affecting enzyme function more things to consider here an inhibitor is a substance that binds to the enzyme and decreases the enzymes activity so if something inhibits an, the enzyme, but it's not the enzyme's substrate, it's not sucrose with regard to sucralase, it's not protein with regard to proteinase, it's not starch with regard to amylase, something else binds in that site. And as a result, the substrate that that enzyme is looking for cannot bind in that site, right? So that substance, whatever it happens to be, is inhibiting that enzyme from doing its job. And there's a couple different kinds of inhibitions that we must consider here. Feedback inhibition. Feedback. Now think about it. Right? You, you, you do some work in school. You hand it over your, to your teacher, your teacher looks at it, she grades it, she gives you feedback, right? So it, it, it's like a completion of the circle. Keep that mental image in mind. So in feedback inhibition, the end product of a pathway inhibits the further action of the enzyme. Okay, the end product of the pathway inhibits the further action of the enzyme. So in other words, the enzyme is doing a job, right? It's acting on a substrate. And when it acts on the substrate, it releases a product. Remember, the enzyme is going to break down, break those chemical bonds, break those covalent bonds, and it's going to release the product. Uh, sucralase is going to break the covalent bond between glucose and fructose. It's going to break that bond and release glucose and fructose. Now, if you, so feedback inhibition says if you get too much sucralose or if you get too much uh, glucose in the system, or fructose in the system, when I'm talking about the system, in this case, I'm talking about your body, but if you get enough of those monomers in your bloodstream, for example, then they feed back to the enzyme and they say, look, don't break down any more sucralose, don't make any more glucose, don't make any more fructose, we're full right now, just hold your horses, right? Don't proceed, we'll let you know when we need more. That's feedback inhibition. That's the end product inhibiting the action of the enzyme. A great example here 
is excess cholesterol in blood inhibiting the production of cholesterol in the liver right we have we have an enzyme that is um, generating cholesterol it's producing cholesterol in the liver okay so it's going to produce cholesterol more cholesterol more cholesterol more cholesterol and when you get enough cholesterol in the system then that cholesterol feeds back on the enzyme and it tells the enzyme hold your horses stop we don't need any more cholesterol right it feeds back to the enzyme thereby inhibiting the action of the enzyme in this case inhibiting the production of cholesterol so the product of the pathway cholesterol feeds back and inhibits the production of cholesterol and then when your cholesterol runs low then the enzyme kicks into gear more cholesterol like that that's feedback inhibition another type of inhibition is competitive inhibition okay so so to go back to this thought about the inhibitor in feedback inhibition it's the end product of the pathway in this case cholesterol that is the inhibitor cholesterol inhibits the production of cholesterol by the enzyme that's feedback inhibition competitive inhibition is when the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site so within the milieu within your body you have the substrate uh, say protein if we're talking about protease you have the protein there and then there is something else right maybe it's some sort of lipid or some sort of other molecule that will also fit into that active site of that enzyme now remember what I said before enzymes are very specific only the right key will fit into the enzyme lock but remember think about this um, like in a motel right your key fits into your door uh, room 106 your key will not fit into the door of room 107 however down at the front desk they have a master key and that the, the person can come up and take that master key and open room 106 as well as open room 107 okay <laughs> crazy example huh but what happens here is there are other things we call them inhibitors and it's not always the case and it's, and it's not predominantly the case but there are other things that will fit into that lock like a master key and when the master key see when the master key is in that lock your key cannot fit into the lock and open the lock I guess that's really not a great example because a master key will open the lock but if you're staying in room 106 and your friend is staying in room 107 your friend can bring their key from 107 and fit it into your door the key fits into your door it just doesn't unlock the door all right and when when your friend's key is in your door you cannot get your key into your lock to open your door all right that's really actually a better example of competitive inhibition so their key will fit into your lock and when their key is in your lock you can't fit your key in there so their key is competing with your lock competing with your key for your lock does that make sense so the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site so if the inhibitor binds in the active site then the substrate cannot bind in the active site and so the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site all right 
Now, on the other side of the coin, there's non-competitive inhibition. Here is where the inhibitor binds somewhere else. We call it we call it the allosteric site. Okay, it binds somewhere else on the enzyme on the on the structure of the enzyme, just not in the active site. And when the uh, allosteric site is filled, when that inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it causes this the shape of the enzyme, and specifically the shape of the active site, to shift, to change, to turn, to twist just a little bit, such that now protein can no longer fit into the active site, because the shape of the active site is different than the shape of the protein than the shape of the substrate. So some inhibitor, some sort of molecule binds somewhere else on the enzyme causing a conformational change, that's a shape change, in the active site of the enzyme such that the enzyme can no longer bind the substrate. That's non-competitive because here we have a molecule that's not competing with the active site, right? But it is changing the chemical shape of the active site so that the enzyme cannot work. With competitive in inhibition, the inhibitor competes directly with the active site. Okay, so it kind of looks like this. So with competitive inhibition, that's what we see over here. Here's your enzyme, here's your active site, here's your substrate, this is protein, if this is protease. Now here is an inhibitor that has just enough of the shape here to fit into that active site. And when that inhibitor binds to the active site, look, the substrate can no longer bind to the active site and it just bounces off. So the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site. When the inhibitor is there, then that renders the enzyme non-functional. Doesn't kill the enzyme, doesn't denature the enzyme, just shuts it down for the moment. Okay, with uh, allosteric inhibition or non-competitive inhibition, here we see the inhibitor, which is this little green dot, little green sphere here. And we have this is the allosteric site over there. And so you have the little green sphere molecule, whatever that is, it binds to the allosteric site, right? So this is a site somewhere else on the enzyme. And when that happens, the shape of the active site changes, it shifts, it twists, it turns just a little bit such that the substrate can no longer fit in there, can no longer bind to the active site. So the inhibitor, the allosteric inhibitor, does not compete with the substrate for the active site. It binds somewhere else, and when it, but when it does that, it changes the shape of the active site such that the substrate can no longer bind there. Okay, and then um, we have coenzymes. You've heard of coenzymes before. Uh, you see commercials about CoQ10 on television. You've heard of coenzymes. You may even take a coenzyme supplement. I do. Coenzymes transfer electrons from one enzyme to another, all right? So they work between enzymes. They, they help enzymes work. So you take enzymes from one, uh, electrons from one enzyme, you shift them to another enzyme. So it just helps enzymes function. Coenzymes are not used up. Um, they just continuously flow in the milieu and they do their job. Coenzymes are non-protein, organic molecules, of course, We're talking about organic systems. And examples that you're familiar with are vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and you've heard certainly of CoQ10. CoQ10 is like everywhere all the time. 
and because of that we call it ubiquinol um, if something is ubiquitous it's everywhere it's all the time it's like oxygen in the air right oxygen is ubiquitous in our environment not so much when you're deep sea diving right not a lot of oxygen down there um, so something that is ubiquitous is everywhere all the time and in the case of CoQ10 CoQ10 is like that B6 B12 we get from food we eat CoQ10 or you, you get CoQ10 from stuff that you eat but what I'm saying is CoQ10 is in your system it's in the body it's everywhere all the time it's used not just in your respiratory system but it's functional in your digestive system and your nervous system and your circulatory system and your reproductive system. CoQ10 is everywhere all the time. So for that reason, we call it ubiquinol. You get it from lots of different foods or citrus and nuts and eggs and protein. And you can also take supplements for CoQ10. All right, another quick check, final quick check. Excess cholesterol in blood inhibits enzymatic production of cholesterol. This is an example of which type of inhibition. Your choices are feedback inhibition, competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, allosteric inhibition. Give you a second. So excess cholesterol inhibits production of cholesterol. If you answered feedback inhibition, you're absolutely correct. Look what's going on here. Excess cholesterol, that's the product of the production of cholesterol, right? That's the product. When we have an enzyme that produces cholesterol, cholesterol is the product so we have the product excess cholesterol inhibiting the production of cholesterol right it feeds back to the enzyme and it says look enzyme we don't need any more cholesterol right now stop working stop doing your job for the moment feeds back feedback inhibition all right Metabolism. Metalo metabolism is the sum total of all reactions performed by an organism. It's, it's the breakdown of food. It's the building up of muscle. It's the digestion of your hamburger and it's the creation of energy. So it's the sum total of everything. It's all the processes that break stuff down and it's all the processes that make stuff, that synthesize stuff. So anabolic reactions use free energy to build things. The process is called anabolism, and it uses our old friend dehydration synthesis to actually create chemical bonds, create covalent bonds to make things. So anabolic reactions uh, use dehydration synthesis to, for instance, take a bunch of glucose monomers and make a big long starch molecule all right how do you tell the how do you keep the um, these processes or these terms differentiated separated in your mind here's the way I do it so anabolic uh, well first of all you know you can think of anabolic steroids right um, muscle people <laughs> body filled body builders they take anabolic steroids right to build huge muscles so they're building muscle tissue right anabolic steroids do that um, I, I think of a an anabolic starts with an a and a reminds me of adding two so if you take uh, so an anabolic reaction adds to the system it builds things into the system versus catabolic reactions catabolic reactions tear things down they release free energy so anabolic reactions use energy 
catabolic reactions release energy. The process is called catabolism. And catabolic reactions use our old friend hydrolysis, hydrolysis, to break chemical bonds and release energy. So when you make, um, when you want to do active transport, right, you have to cleave that terminal bond of ATP. That's a catabolic reaction. We're using energy by breaking that terminal bond pyrophosphate bond and ATP to drive active transport. That's a catabolic reaction. Okay, here's, you'll see the way my mind works here. So uh, catabolic reminds me of um, catapult. <laughs> you know what a catapult is. You know, back in the Middle Ages, right, they used to have those big wooden structures on wheels, right, in the soldiers used to roll that big thing up to the to the to the wall of the castle and they had a big it had a big arm on it uh, and you used to put a put a big boulder or a rock or a big fireball on the end of that arm and they pull the cord pull the rip cord and the big arm shoots the boulder over the wall or shoots the fireball over the wall the idea is to destroy whatever is inside to catabolize whatever's in inside, to tear down whatever's inside. When I see catabolic or catabolism, I think of catapult. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how my mind works. So I'm going to add to with anabolic reactions. I'm going to tear apart with catabolic reactions. Biochemical pathways are a series of reactions whereby products of the first reaction act as substrates for the next reaction. So we have a series of enzyme-driven reactions, one, two, three, four, for instance. And so enzyme one does its job on its substrate, releases products, and those products are used as substrates for enzyme two. Enzyme two does its job on the product of, of enzyme one, releases its product now, and the product of enzyme two will be used as a substrate for enzyme three, product of enzyme 3 is a substrate for enzyme 4 and finally when 4 releases its product that's the end of the pathway that's the end of the system and yes some metabolic um, processes are are that complicated and even much more complicated and so here's an example of a biochemical pathway so we have four enzymes here enzyme one two three and four you know each has you can see that each has a different shape active site right and so the initial substrate binds to enzyme one enzyme one does its job may, releases its product which is now like this triangle shape so that is and we call this an intermediate substrate it binds to and you can see that these are all connected together. We'll see this when we talk about um, cellular respiration in the next chapter. But we, this product then becomes an intermediate substrate, which then fits into the active site of enzyme 2. Enzyme 2 does its job, releases another intermediate substrate, which then fits into the active site of enzyme 3. Enzyme 3 does its job, releases its product, which now is an intermediate substrate for enzyme 4. It fits in there. Enzyme 4 does its job and releases the end product, the final product. So we have to go through all this process to end up with this, which is useful. These are not useful to, to the organism. They're only useful in the process. It's the end product that is useful to the organism. And yes, many, many um, enzymatic reactions, processes, are made up of a number of enzymes. They, many processes within the body are these chemical pathways. And some of them are much, much more extreme or advanced 
than just four enzymes. Some of them can have 10 enzymes or 50 enzymes, okay? But that's a biochemical pathway where the substrate of the first enzyme, or the, rather the product of the first enzyme is used as the substrate for the second enzyme. The product of the second enzyme becomes a substrate for the third enzyme, and the product of the third enzyme becomes a substrate for the fourth enzyme, with the end product being the useful product. Um, all right, feedback inhibition um, kind of jumps back to when we were talking about feedback inhibition, but here's an illustration of that. So here we see the initial substrate jumps in, the enzyme one releases its product, its product becomes the substrate for enzyme 2. Enzyme 2 releases its product. Its product becomes a substrate for enzyme 3. Enzyme 3 releases its product. Okay, that's the end product. That's the normal cascade, right? Enzymatic cascade, a biochemical cascade. Now, with feedback inhibition, here we see the initial substrate binds to enzyme 1. We're going to go through the process, and that becomes the product for enzyme 2, becomes a product, uh, its product becomes a substrate for enzyme 3. The end product is made, and once you have a, too much of the end product or enough of the end product, it feed, feeds back to the first enzyme in the cascade, and look, it becomes an allosteric inhibitor, binds to a different site on enzyme one, thereby halting the production of enzyme one's product. Changes the configuration of the active site, and so that the substrate for enzyme one can no longer bind there. And therefore, we shut down the cascade. We shut down the process. And then, when you and then when you run out of this stuff, this is going to pop off. The shape is going to change back, and we're back to the normal cascade. Final quick check. Reactions in which chemical bonds are hydrolyzed and energy is released or what type of reactions? Think about it. Your choices are metabolic reactions, anabolic reactions, catabolic reactions, biochemical reactions. Reactions in which chemical bonds are hydrolyzed energy is released. So you know that when chemical bonds are hydrolyzed, you're breaking chemical bonds. So you're taking the big long starch molecule and you're breaking it into monomers of glucose. So you're breaking stuff down. And when you break bonds, you release energy. Do you remember? If you answered catapultic, <laughs> catabolic, these are catabolic reactions that break things down, that hydrolyze chemical bonds and release energy. All right. That is the end of this lecture, the second lecture in for chapter six. And now you have every, everything you need for chapter six. And next week we move on to cellular respiration. Thank you.